my immense pleasure to be able to present before you all for the, on the occasion of Black History Month. <clears throat> and uh, I want to thank you for being here. I, uh, I chose a topic that I thought would be very pertinent um, to the theme of Black History Month and a topic that has received very little scholarly attention. So it's the tracing the African presence in South Asian history from the past to the present. <clears throat> I've used information from archeological, genetical, biological studies, anthropological, and linguistic analysis and hypotheses, all of which are current and topical. So, However, before I really go into the content, I'd like to point out that the peopling of South Asia is a very contentious area of research and discourse. In a path-breaking study titled The Indo-Aryan Controversy, the authors Bryant and Patton, and the book was published in 2005, they perceived the pitfalls of conducting unbiased research on the subject by stating that, quote, we now exist in an era where one's use of evidence is inevitably suspect of being linked to nationalist, colonialist, or cultural agendas. So we, you know, we all are aware of that. Beyond this debate is also the overview that the region of South Asia was settled by multiple human migrations over tens of millennia which make it even harder to label certain groups as being truly aboriginal or indigenous South Asian tribes. Furthermore, crossovers in languages and ethnicity complicate the study on various population groups as there is no exact match between their ethnic origins and linguistic affiliations. So even though they may look very much like Africans, their languages are Aryan, you know, because over the years they have acculturated and they picked up all of these other languages in order to, uh, well, survive culturally with the mainstream. So that's the point. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So that's South Asia there, and it refers to the. Um, geographic area of the entire Indian subcontinent. <clears throat> now today, we call it South Asia, and it includes these regions, Pakistan, of course, India, Bangladesh, which was formerly East Bengal, you have Nepal there, you have the Maldives Islands um, over here, and uh, you also have, uh, you see, Nepal, Maldives, Sri Lanka. Here, okay. So all of that is included in the region we call South Asia, and they were all parts of India before the you know the British left India. They were all one, but after the partition, they become separate countries. Okay. African migration to the Indian subcontinent occurred in both voluntary and involuntary ways. At present, the South Asian Afro-Asian population groups vary in ethnic and linguistic identities and are concentrated primarily in the Indian Ocean Islands, over here in South India, okay, in Bangladesh, Pakistan, and of course in India, you have Western India, a very big concentration there and very big concentration in South India. There are Adivasi. Now, Adivasi is a term which literally means indigenous, the truly indigenous tribe, the pure, the first, the descendants of the first settlers. Okay. So, <clears throat> the um, I, I just said that that the Adivasi are mainly here, concentrated here, and in Bangladesh. Okay. These are the two regions that they are concentrated in. Um, now, these tribes. The government of India, when the Indian constitution was founded in 1951, the government of India labeled these tribes, the original tribes, as scheduled tribes. Scheduled. That's how it's called. Okay? 
and the low caste pavilions who I'm going to talk to you about at the scheduled castes. Now all of these are the Appalachian groups. Okay? So scheduled tribes, scheduled caste, and then we have in Pakistan the Appalachian groups are called the Shidis or the Makranis. Okay? In um, uh, Bangladesh, as I said, they are the scheduled tribes. In Western India, they are called the Siddhis, S-I-D-D-I-S, Siddhis. And in Sri Lanka, they are called the Kafirs, K-A-F-F-I-R-S. Okay, so a few of the African descendant groups still retain some of their African traditions, such as the Siddhis of India, who still speak Swahili and Ethiopian language words. They sing Swahili songs and worship African gods. The musical anthem of the ruling Pakistan People's Party, the anthem is called Bija Tir, and that is actually, the language of the song is from Baluchistan. So that's Aryan, as I was telling you, that there's a big overlap between ethnic culture and ethnic languages. So uh, they, they have the language from Balochistan, but the musical style um, uses the black African rhythm and the drums. So it's, it's just an acculturation. However, most of the urban communities and tribal people, they try to acculturate and assimilate into their surrounding population by adopting the language, religion, and rituals for survival and social acceptance. So that's what makes it even more difficult today to figure out, you know, the actual African groups because they are so merged into everything else. Okay. All right, so here I've just given you a breakdown of the, what I just said. The Adivasis are the indigenous people. They live in this island and they're part of the scheduled tribes. This is another group of people that travel in eastern India and Bangladesh. They are categorized as scheduled tribes too. The low caste rebellions in southern India, they are categorized as scheduled caste. The Siddhis in Gujarat, western India, Shidis, Makranis in Pakistan, <coughs> and the Kapis in Sri Lanka. These are the discernible Appalachian groups today. Now, here I'm going to the content. There are two theories, two predominant theories. The first is the monogenetic theory supported by scientific studies of DNA, which underscores that man originated in Africa, and that anatomically modern humans also originated in Africa between 200 to 100,000 years ago. The second important theory is the out of Africa theory, which posits that the AMH, which is the anatomically modern human, grouped under Negrito and Australoid peoples, they left Africa around 60,000 years ago, migrating to other parts of the world. So they went everywhere. They went to Europe, they went to Asia, they were everywhere. The anatomically modern humans originating from Africa. So, you know, as I, when I started out, I said that through genetic mutation, uh, people look different, but no part of the world can claim that, you know, they don't have the African roots because the AMH went everywhere from Africa, and that's the truth. Okay. Now, there were two groups migrating out of Africa, okay? There was the Negroid, who actually, uh, were the descendants of the Capoid group. The Capoid are those peoples concentrated in the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. So the descendants of the Capoid, they are called the Proto-Capoid or the Negroid. They, they originated out of the Cape of Good Hope and they, you know, about 60 or 50,000 years ago. The other one was those who followed the Negroid. They were called the Australoid. They also have African descent. So the Negroid and the Australoid pushed slowly. They went out of Africa. They pushed slowly along the coastlines of the Arabian Peninsula. Now I showed you the map of India before. 
So, and they went to India. Now, no archaeological record of these epic journeys has been found. Perhaps because the world's oceans were 120 meters lower during the last ice age, and the evidence of early human passage is now underwater. The population of Southeast Asia prior to 6,000 years ago was composed largely of groups of hunter-gatherers similar to Negroid types, and the genetic analysis on both the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA paint a clear picture of a coastal leak. Okay, before I show that map to you, this is the Adivasi. This is how the India, the Adivasi in South Asia looks. That's the typical Adivasi, the pure one. Okay. Now here is the, the migration, the first human migration, and all of those uh, letters that you see are actually the genetic classification, okay? So the, uh, the M, L, all of these are the DNA classifications of early humans. So, <clears throat> the thesis is that um, the studies on the Y chromosome and the empty DNA paint the clear picture of the coastal leaf from Africa to Southeast Asia and onward to Australia. The genetic research reinforces a hypothesis that the, neg the Negritos and the Australoids from Africa were the earliest racial elements in India and primitive tribes of South India and Indian Ocean Island have pronounced Negrito physical characteristics, though they are not pure Negritos because of genetic mutation over subsequent centuries. Now, these survived right from the Paleolithic era of human history, that's the first age of human history, the Old Stone Age, and they are often classified as the indigenous peoples. Thus, experts on the Y chromosome state that the Paleolithic population of Asia might well have looked African, as African. Finally, other studies have evidence that the Arab slave trade brought millions of East Africans, majority to Arabia, Middle East, and to the Indian subcontinent during the 8th, 9th, and the 19th centuries. In addition, anthropologists and geneticists theorize that following the Negroid and Australoid, Caucasoid peoples, including Mediterranean-based Dravidians from Iran and Indo-Aryans from the Central Asian steppes, as well as Mongoloid peoples, also referred to as the Sino-Tibetans or Alpine stocks, immigrated into South Asia. Therefore, you see the present-day South Asians look different. I mean, all, all, they don't look the same. You'll see different groups looking different. Okay, it's because of all of the genetic, um, you know, uh, blend. All right. Okay, so this is again what I just explained. I broke it down for you to, um, to understand. So you have the protocapoids from the Cape of Good Hope. From them came the Negroids who migrated uh, to India and beyond to Australia. The Australoid tribes are also of African origin. And they followed the Negroid. And then you have the Paleolithic groups all over South Asia being African. All right, <clears throat> now I'll go to the scheduled cast that I mentioned to y'all at the beginning. One of the identified Afro-Asian groups in South Asia. They are called uh, the Dalits, D-A-L-I-T-S. What I've written there, Dalit, and Dalit literally means crushed or broken. And they are called that because they are not given equal opportunities, equal rights and privileges. And we all suffer from discrimination, you know. And appetite is universal. So South Asia is no different. You have a lot of appetite there. Okay, so previously, they were called the untouchables. But after Mahatma Gandhi took the leadership in India, he changed the, the term 
to, he called them Harijan, meaning children of God, in order to bring equality, okay? But after independence, the Constitution refers to them as the scheduled tribes. The most substantial percentage of South Asia's apparitions may be identified among the 170 million or 16.2% of India's untouchable or Delhi. So I've given you the visual of uh, here's a family uh, belonging to this group. Dalits, as I said, literally means crushed or broken. An important racial, ethnic, and linguistic component of the scheduled caste group are the low caste Dravidians, and a powerful dichotomy rages between scholars over the origins of this group. There's still this debate going on. Are they purely African or of mixed African Mediterranean lineage? Now the term Dravidian encompasses both an ethnic group and a linguistic group. Okay, here is another face of the, the, this particular group and the kind of jobs they do. So you see he's, I think, a, a shoemaker. Yeah. All right, the ethnic group is characterized by straight to wavy hair textures combined with Africoid physical features. Dravidian also denotes an important family of languages spoken by more than 100 million people, primarily in southern India. Among these languages, Tamil is the largest element. And we have many Tamil-speaking faculty on campus, by the way, from India. An African scholar and physicist, Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop, states that Dravidians are a type of the black race and that there are, that there are two well-defined black races. Now, one, he says, has um, black skin and woolly hair. Okay, so here I've given you a uh, uh, Dravidian people here. Actually, they are tribal people. So you have a young pregnant girl and I've given you a youth, uh, a Dravidian youth. Okay, so this is one definition that uh, Dr. Diop gives and the, the other The other is this feature, says uh, the other also has black skin, often exceptionally black with straight hair, aquiline nose, thin lips, and an acute cheekbone angle. So I wanted to show y'all the two varieties. Okay, we find a prototype of the latter race in India, the Dravidian. In 1999, a group of authors uh, Kibisil et al. They are, uh, you know, genetic geneticists. They authored a paper claiming that Dravidians carry the M1 haplogroup, which proved that they must be related to Africans because the AGM1 is primarily found in Africa, especially Ethiopia. A few other genetic studies have confirmed anthropological views that the Dravidian the tribal peoples, and the lower caste Hindus belong to the African diaspora. In the pioneering mitochondria DNA study, the authors write, these authors that I just cited to you, write, quote, the caste populations of Andhra Pradesh, which is southern India, cluster more often with Africans than with Asians and Europeans, quote, unquote. On the other hand, there are other anthropological and genetic analysis that the Dravidians may have migrated to India from Iran in the West, which brings in the Mediterranean element. That's why, you know, even among Dravidian peoples today in India, you'll find them looking all different. They don't look the same way, simply because of this mix-up. They argue that the Dravidian groups vary widely since they have received extensive gene flow from different castes and linguistic groups of other regions in India. The study infers that the biological status of the present-day Dravidian groups can be considered as immigrants at various periods of time. So that's the compromise. Okay. Now, notwithstanding 
If we may identify the Dravidian as belonging to the African Asian group, then Dravidian civilizations throughout southern India would stand as valid examples of bearing the African presence to some extent through different eras of South Asian history from the past to the present. So we have this literate civilization that came up uh, around, it's reached its peak around 2300 BC in Northwestern India, a powerful literate Copper Age civilization called the Indus Valley or Harappa culture. So this is belonged to have been founded by the Dravidian peoples. <coughs> Now, there's evidence also that during this period of the Indus Valley from 2300 to about 1500 BC, there were other racial elements too, okay? <coughs> Excuse me, Mediterranean and Mongoloid also lived there. However, the Dravidians founded this civilization, that's the consensus. So, <coughs> the society spread all across the, along the course of the Indus River, and Africa features are evidenced here in excavated artifacts such as the figurine of the dancing girl. So you can see the features. You can see the features there, which makes us aware of the fact that you know the African presence was very pronounced in the civilization. This is not. I just showed you one artifact. Okay, there were many that were unearthed. Now, from the 3rd century Christian era, three major Dravidian kingdoms, and I mean, you know, I'm talking still about the African presence here, existed in South India. And this is South India, so all of this uh, dark area here was the site of the Dravidian kingdoms. Okay, you have the Cheras here, and then we have the Cholas here. Madurai was the capital of the Chola kingdom and you have the Pandyas up here in the north. So, now the Pandya Kingdom, its center of learning and cultural renaissance. Actually, the Pandya Kingdom stretched down along the coast here. So, uh, here was the Pandya. This, this is the Cheras and the Cholas will come with there. So, the Pandyas also gave their women considerable freedom and access to public life. The kingdom of Chera is the present day of uh, Kerala and that's the most literate state in India today, 100% literacy there. And the Cholas were unusually advanced seafaring people and uh, they were one of the dominant maritime powers in India. The, they had numerous ports and they traded with Ethiopia, Somalia, Iran, Arabia, China, Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka exporting spices, camphor, ebony, ivory, textiles, and precious jewels. And today, the villages in southern India have residents also who likely are descended from Mozambique or Angolan slaves who escaped from Portuguese traders and ships. Finally, I'm coming to the Dravidian statuary. Okay, this is one of the Dravidian, ancient Dravidian architecture that has still survived the passage of time. And we have the statuary here, which again raises a serious debate. Now the case in point, serious debate on the African influence on the Dravidian culture. So the case in point here is the Black Buddha statuary found in some ancient temples in Asia in which Buddha is depicted as black in color with a flat face, thick lips, and curly hair of the African. Now, African scholars claim that since the Dravidian peoples who fashioned and worshipped the images of the Buddha and the Hindu god Vishnu, yes, Vishnu, he's the god of peace, so he saves the good souls. Okay, so since these images were fashioned and worship in the Dravidian temples in the African Africoid mold of humanity must, according to all knowledge of human nature, have African origins. So that's their basis for the argument. 
Now, the portrayal of these images raised intriguing questions about Dravidian racial and cultural origin in South Asia, and the debate still goes on. Okay. Now, I'm going to the actual Adivasi, the original tribes, the pure tribes, who live here. These are the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Over here, as you can see, that's India, and the islands are here, so I've just inflated that image for you. They are believed to be uh, the, real, the real indigenous peoples of India. I'm repeating that again. Okay. Now, these islands are theorized to be a key stepping stone in a great coastal migration of humans from Africa via the Arabian Peninsula along the coastal regions of the South Asian mainland and towards Southeast Asia and Japan. There are about 550 Indian Ocean archipelagic islands in the Bay of Bengal with a total population of 356,000 people. It's a great tourist center, but only 1,000 of these 356,000 peoples are the indigenous people, the Adivasi of the Andamans. But they belong to a variety of tribal groups. You know, you have Andamanis, Jarwa, Ongi, Champagne, and the Sentinelis. Genetic analysis, again, of the empty DNA, a genetic element that is passed down only to women, shows that the Ongi and the Jarwa of these groups belong to a lineage known as M that is common throughout Asia. Now that's from the matriarchal side. And that established that this study establishes these groups as Asians, not Africans, among whom a different empty DNA lineage called L is dominant. However, Geneticists also looked at the Y chromosome, which is passed down only through men, and often gives a more detailed picture of genetic history than the empty DNA. The Andre and the Jarwa men turned out to carry a special change or mutation in the DNA of their Y chromosome that is thought to be indicative of the Paleolithic population of Asia, the hunters and gatherers who preceded the first human settlement. The mutation is known as marker 174, and it is found among the Andamanese peoples to suggest that they too are a part of the relic Paleolithic African population descended from the first modern humans to leave Africa. Hence, genetic mutation occurred among these peoples, which make them not purely African, but as having strong African lineage. Now this is a typical Andamanese couple here. The, the Andaman tribal people still live in the forests and jungles of the interior islands and uh, you know the capital of the Andaman is Port Blair, it's the commercial uh, tourist center but as I said there are 550 islands here. The 2004 December tsunami and the 2010 March earthquake took a huge mortality toll among these poor island tribes. So this is one uh, case study. Now I'm going to, again, the political map of India to show you another Adivasi group that is very prominent here in Bangladesh, which was formerly East Bengal. Okay. So it was in India, today it's a separate country. So the people who live here are also here, Bihar, this state here, Jharkhand. Okay, they are very prolific here, the group that I'm just going to talk about, and even in West Bengal. Okay, so just this region. Now these groups constitute the largest tribe in India, and uh, they are called the Santals. So yes, you have a picture of a Santal woman, and they are designated as having African origin. Now the total population of the Santals today is around 42,689. They continue to live in remote areas, and they engage in fishing, hunting, agriculture, and crafts in order to sustain their livelihood. It is interesting to note 
that the St. Paul community waged war against the British under Lord Cornwallis during his permanent settlement act uh, when he tried to seize Indian lands in 1855. Now, they have a very nice hobby and it's a real pleasure to watch the Santals dance. So dancing is a prominent trait of their culture and their most conspicuous mode of celebration during their religious festivals. So, overall, the modern day groups identified as what I told you, the Dalits or the scheduled castes and tribes, they suffer from caste exploitation in the worst form. 86.25% of the scheduled caste households are landless and 49% of the scheduled caste in the rural areas are agricultural workers. The Dalits are subject to physical untouchability and other forms of discrimination despite their being declared unlawful. But segregation is just the tip of the iceberg. As well as Dalits being forbidden to worship in the same temples as the other caste groups from using the same wells and drinking from the same cups, they are denied land that is legally theirs and they are made to perform degrading tasks that are often subjected to violence. They are being rapidly mobilized today, but before going to that, I want to give you some statistics here. So these are the states where you have a concentration of the scheduled caps and tribes, and I've given you the percentage of concentration there. Then the, some facts and figures on these people, uh, the, you know, the proportion of the males as, as opposed to the females, the school attendance among, uh, in the, you know, among the boys and the girls belonging to this group. So, uh, just to show you that they are not up to, uh, they are not receiving the benefits that other groups receive in South Asia today. The unemployment rate of the scheduled caste is 5% of the others, 2.5. The total judges in the high court, 544, and out of that you have only 13 from the scheduled caste groups, although they may be very educated, okay? And the, uh, the tribe, tribe judges, that scheduled tribe judges, only four. School teachers, 6.7, and university instructors, 2.6. Then other socioeconomic indicators on these people, um, the fixed capital is set 27%, others are at 35, land holdings, landless households 70%, child labor is very prominent in India. Now total in India, 60 million, 40% comes from this group. So you see the exploitation level over here. Then the poverty, uh, levels, the rural scheduled caste and tribe, they are below the poverty line, 35.4%. Others, 21%. The urban tribes and caste who live in the cities, poverty, below poverty line, 29%. Others, 15%. Okay, this is the point I was trying to make here. The Dalit peoples are being rapidly mobilized by the Dalit Panther Party today that was founded in 1972 to claim equality with the upper caste in terms of rights and privileges. Over the years, the Indian constitution has attempted to, to offer reasonable quotas in terms of access to education and economic opportunities, but it leaves much to be desired. At the present time, the Dalit peoples are slowly being made aware of their African ancestry and the literate are being familiarized with African American history and literature and their party organizations have, are spreading to all major cities in India. So that's a very strong emerging movement, but there's still a long way to go before they are able to mobilize the, the common people. Okay. So that's the scheduled castes and tribes. Um, this is just the overview that I've made there on these people. These are again some more faces from southern India. Um, young girls, and uh, and I, I just mentioned that statement there that uh, black is beautiful, but 
it is not as yet recognized in this part of the world as yet. Okay. All right. Now this is Bangladesh, and again, I mentioned to you that the Santals are a major um, Adivasi group in Bangladesh, or um, that was formerly East Bengal. So, now this group, here is again a kind of dance uh, staged by the tribal women, the Santals. <coughs> they are also considered to be uh, in the scheduled caste group, the Dravidian sect. And uh, physically, they, you know, they are long-headed, dark-skinned, broad-nosed, short in stature. A popular hypothesis is that the Aryan conquest of the Indus Valley led to a diaspora of the surviving Dravidian population to the south and the rest being displaced to the east into Bangladesh. So today, the native population of Bangladesh speak Bengali or Bangla, a Sanskrit base. I was talking to you about all of this, you know, confusion with ethnic identity and language identity, they are polarized. So that's why it's very difficult to label the, uh, you know, the, the ancestry of a particular group. So they speak Bangla, which is a Sanskrit based Indo European language, hybridized with various indigenous Dravidian elements. The con now, these people converted to Islam in the 8th century when the Arabs invaded North India and Pakistan. So Bangladesh has majority Muslim population. But unfortunately, the upper caste Muslims called the sheikhs or the Saeeds with light skin color, they do not marry into the dark, with the dark skin natives. So in modern times, the Arab Saeed landowners they have collaborated with some Hindu ones to persecute the tribal centers to confiscation of the ancestral land. Most of the village aborigines remain poor and illiterate. They typically work as housemaids in Arab households. The residuals who did not convert to Islam, they are really persecuted, those who didn't con uh, you know, convert. So they are made to do the most menial jobs, uh, cleaning human feces from the street gutters, etc. So, but as I said, while black is beautiful and while the black population in Bangladesh constitutes 90 to 95 percent of their total population, black is still not recognized as beautiful there. And that's very, that's a big tragedy. Okay. Finally, I'm going to go to some medieval African dynasties in South Asia that uh, you know were very prominent during the medieval era. And they ruled parts of Eastern Bengal and uh, you know Western India. So here, this is Western India here, and you have a big concentration of the African population here in the state of Gujarat in this region, Junaga, etc. So, in the 15th century, 1487 to 1493, an Abyssinian dynasty that hailed from Ethiopia, they ruled over the eastern parts of Bengal under a single unified Muslim sultanate. You know, there was a major Muslim invasion of India in the medieval period, and so, um, the, these people probably converted to Islam. The Abyssinian rule marked one of the most unique eras of Bengal's history, where the rulers imparted great benevolence to the poor and destitute, as well as demonstrated in process patronage of the arts, literature, architecture, science, and medicine. Now here is a group that I pointed out called the CD that I mentioned to you at the very beginning. They are called the Siddhis or originally the Hapshis, and their ancestors go back to the pre-medieval era. Now these are there today, the Siddhis in Western India. Most are believed to be the descendants of sailors, servants, slaves, and merchants from the Bantu-speaking parts of East Africa who became resident in Western India between from 1200 to the 20th century. Indeed, the island Janjira 
was called Hapshan before, meaning African land. It is believed that the first cities may have arrived here in 628 BC, then followed by other Islamic invasion of the subcontinent in 712 BC. And actually, city is an honorable title. It means Lord, okay? And uh, some of these cities, original cities, also came in as military officers and administrators of the Muslim princes in the, in, uh, the desert. Now, presently, these people are Sufi Muslims. A very few are Hindus or Catholics. There are cities living, I was said, in Gujarat, and uh, they have adopted the language and many customs of the surrounding population. However, they cultivate some cultural traditions like the Goma music and dance form, which is called Tamal in the you know, indigenous language. The word Goma is derived from the Swahili word for dance, Nagoma, performed with drums in East Africa. And here you see that these are the Indian drums, though. And uh, you have uh, here's the typical dancer, the, the Goma dancer in Western India. African descendants, now here's another case. This is a young city girl in Western India. Now we are going to the south of India, Sri Lanka, where you have a significant Afro-Asian population. So um, this population is concentrated here in Trincomalee, okay, in Kutalam here, and uh, in Vaticola, okay, and also in uh, Moselle, let me see, Colombo, Nagombo here. All right, so they are called the Sri Lankan Kafirs. Now, the word Kafir is an obsolete English term that was once used to designate African natives from the eastern and southern coasts. By 1444, the Sinhalese imported African slaves to Sri Lanka. The Kafirs were brought to Sri Lanka to serve as laborers and soldiers for the Sri Lankan rulers who fought the Portuguese occupation. Now, during the European colonization in India, both the Dutch and the British used the Kathirs as a part of their naval force and for domestic work. The Kathirs, as I told you, are settled in those big cities and they are proud to be called Sri Lankans and they acknowledge their African history. So here you have a very literate group, okay? And they are very proud of their ancestry. Here you have a typical urban uh, Sri Lankan Kathir lady. And here is the Sri Lankan Catholic choir. Okay? And this was the, actually I meant to show this to you earlier, this is uh, the city, the city ancestor. Okay? From Abyssinia. So, and this is one of their relics still standing in, um, in Bengal, uh, one of the ancient African dynasties. Okay, <clears throat> so in summation, serious scholars of African Asian history contend that the African presence in Asia, including the African presence in classical Asian civilization, is one of the most significant, challenging, and least written about aspects of the global African experience. And that even today, after an entire series of holocausts and calamities, the African presence in Asia may exceed 300 million people. <clears throat> As stated at the very beginning, anthropological, archaeological, genetical, and linguistic studies identify certain population groups and tribal people in the Indian subcontinent with discernible African genes, African physical features, and African tradition. And finally, today, there is an emerging um, African um, well, Pan-African movement taking shape in a few parts of South, a uh, South Asia. However, it is still confined to the intelligentsia level and as I said, the common people need to be mobilized and they are being mobilized slowly. Okay, so... Now those are some of the references I used to prepare this presentation and to to get my information from. 
and there are many, many more on this, but it's still, I mean, there's no major study, meaning a monograph or a book is yet published on, you know, the African presence in South Asia. So, <clears throat> I, I, once again, when I started out, there were very few people here, so I said I'm very thankful and I uh, appreciate it that I have this opportunity to present uh, this information today at the Black History Month Forum and uh, to recognize the African global community. And my attempt to recognize the African global community today is, uh, is my tribute to the Black History Month this year. So thank you. And you have any questions? And you see. Oh. I have a I was talking to my supervisor, Dr. Jager. I had never um, read about the caste system, and I didn't know that the two unique systems were, are this system in America and that caste system. So you said that the cities were uh, there, are uh, still there today, but there was 680 before Christ. Okay, the CDs, the CD people. Am I saying it right? The CD. CD. The CD. They were there. Uh, so who are the who are the indigenous people? The indigenous people came sixty thousand years ago during the Paleolithic era. So they came from the Capoy group, Cape of Good Hope. Okay. Are they yes. still there? Their descendants are all everywhere. The are descendants of no, the cities are, were later African peoples who were brought over by the Arab traders. Okay. 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 Yeah. So the Arabs have been trading, you know, since before Christ. I mean, uh, actually since the Indus Valley time, uh, that's 2300 BC, India was trading with Egypt, Mesopotamia, Africa, you know, they were all trading by boat. So they were bringing in these people, some of them stayed, so some of them were forcibly brought in, some of them came voluntary. So the migration to South Asia from Africa was both voluntary and involuntary. And it was spread over from the Paleolithic era right up to the 19th century. Okay. And still today, they cannot move up into... No, not, not those who converted to Islam now. The okay. cities are Islamic now, okay. they're Islamic. But you see, the, the caste system is, that is also apartheid. But it's breaking down, it, it's not so prominent anymore. But the, the prejudices are still inherent. What I'm going to say, and that's how I can define it. The actual barriers of the caste system are being assailed and breaking down. But the prejudices are something psychological that you can't break down by law. That's inside you, right? right? But what we suffer from discrimination here is very different from the caste system discrimination. It's not just color. It's not just color. It's, it's marriage, it's religious diet, it, it's a whole paraphernalia of customs that are built into the caste system rubric. And so it's very hard to define. Unless you're from there, it's very difficult to understand how it works. Thank you. Because you mentioned the word the people. Uh, in the Philippines, there's a group of people living in the mountains that are called Negritos, and they're also of African descent. The word Negrito in Spanish is small Negro. So uh, they are sort of like not quite pygmies, but they're short, short in stature, but they're all African people. Right. And uh, that, that, the out of, that lends credence to the out of Africa theory, which is the predominant theory that, you know, the first AMH migration, the anat anatomically modern humans, they originated in Africa and they migrated to other parts of the world. So not any European can say that, oh, no one came here. Oh, everyone went there. Everyone went to Asia. They went everywhere. 
But again, if the genetic mutation that makes us look different over the centuries of evolution, that's the truth. No one can deny it. Um, I've read the book Matavan's Kafa Boy, and it, it talks about um, a South African student who comes to Colombia to pay, play tennis. But the word Kafa in South Africa is equivalent to the N word in America. And I noticed you used the to the word, what word? The N word. Oh. <laughs> so I see you, you use half a sort of gracious. So is there is it is it that ambiguity that exists? Actually, uh, yes, the concept has changed because, as I told you, it's an obsolete English term. The original meaning was derogatory. So the original meaning of Kafir was derogatory, derogatory. but in, in, in Sri Lanka today, it is, a, it is a respectable word because this is a respectable community, the Kafirs, and they're very proud of their identity and their culture. And these are, uh, among all of those people that I identified for you, they are 50% uh, of them are tribal peoples, but 50% are urban peoples, okay? The scheduled calf, they, many of them live in the city. And now the Kafirs are in Sri Lanka, they are, they live equally with the other people. There's no discrimination, okay? So, Dr. Das, the young... And the, uh, the Kafirs are Catholics, Catholics. Most of them are Catholics. Okay, now, the, un the, the people formerly known as the untouchables. And you said um, they were renamed by... Uh, the Indian Constitution? Yes. Why are they untouchable? Why? It's, it's not that they have leprosy. They're not <laughs> sick. No. That's where the caste system That's comes into play. Because, um, actually, you know, the caste system originated based on occupation. So when the Indo-Aryans came into India, they had divided themselves into occupational groups. The Brahmanas, the Kshatriyas, who were the warriors or the kings. The Brahmanas were the priests. The Vaishyas were the merchants, the traders, the businessmen. And the Sudras were the manual workers. So when they came in, when the Indo-Aryans came in, they had three classes. That's the Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, and the Vaishyas. When they came in and conquered the Dravidian peoples, now that, this is a conventional hypothesis. Mm -hmm. the, the lower class Dravidian, the lower class Dravidian, mm -hmm. were sub subjected to the Sudra group. That's how you're the fourth occupational group, Sudra. But it was still occupational. But as the fair-skinned Aryans began to mingle with the darker-skinned natives, color prejudice crept in. That's Varna. So ultimately, caste system came to embed not just, you know, other prejudices, but the color prejudice also crept in at that time. And those uh, peoples who actually were very poor among the sudras, they were made to do very menial jobs. And these people were classified as untouchables. Okay? Meaning they were so lonely that you cannot even, they were not even allowed to be anywhere around when you were in the marketplace or you were doing some ceremonial duty or something. And today, in many villages, even though it's, it's uh, unlawful, yet you have the untouchables living in segregated villages. They have their own economic system, their own drinking water wells, their own marketplace and everything. But let me also tell you on a, light, on a more uplifting note, Today, there are marriages between higher castes and scheduled castes. In my community here in Louisiana, I have many scheduled caste friends. Okay? So it, it, it's a lot of change has taken place today. But the economic condition of the poor people in the rural area is still very dismal, still very um, pathetic. You know, that needs to be improved. So you class Caucasian strictly by birth, huh? hmm? by having been born into that caste, you are the... Yeah, so no, no Indian has an identity without a caste. That's the identity. So 
I'm sure we have a lot of Indian faculty on campus, and you ask them, they'll tell you the same thing. What caste do you come from? And they may say Brahmin, okay? They may say Kshatriya, but that is the identity, it's ingrained. That's the, that's the cultural um, root, the caste. Now, not that we support the caste system, but we are born into a caste. What is your <laughs> Thank you, I have a class. <laughs> On behalf of the Center for Afro African American Studies, I want to thank uh, Dr. Das, uh, the Chair of the Department of Arts and Humanities, for sharing this uh, work in progress with us. I know we've talked about this, and uh, hopefully, uh, uh, we're going to publish this in our academic journal next year. Please give Dr. Das. Thank you. 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 Thank you.